use. Uh, damage control resuscitation. Nothing to disclose. Injury is a big deal. This paper is in New England Journal of Medicine. If you ever need an EPI paper to start a talk off with, this is a great one. 10% uh, of all worldwide deaths, worldwide deaths. And the total number of deaths from injuries is greater than the number from infection with HIV, TB, and malaria combined. Uh, and it's getting bigger every year. The other thing that this paper talked about, it's not war and conflict. That's actually a very small percentage. Most of them were road traffic accidents or motor vehicle crashes. And the number has increased death from injury by 24% over the last decade. So this unfortunately is a growth uh, population. You know, I've showed this slide before, death occurs very early. The point here is if you're going to intervene, you have to have these, uh, all of your interventions, techniques, tactics, procedures have to be set up ahead of time. You can't make it up at 2 a.m. I'm going to give you my bottom line up front. This is an Army phrase, bluff, bottom line up front. When you're briefing the generals, this is your bluff slide. And crystalloid is bad if you're bleeding. All right, that's not what we were taught, but it increases blood loss, transfusion requirements, and death. Balanced blood product. Notice I didn't say one to one or one to two. You can kind of pick right now. I'll talk about that in a minute. But a balanced blood product resuscitation decreases blood loss, transfusion requirements, and improves survivals. So this little phrase is the first time I've done this. I was talking to Dr. Rizzoli, and, and he and I are really good friends. We tease each other all the time. Uh, I think if you're going to do DCR or balanced blood product resuscitation, you have to have thawed or liquid plasma in the ED. If you don't, it takes you 60 minutes to get out of the blood bank. Anybody's ever, all the folks who've measured this take 60 minutes, and so you start off giving crystalloid and red cells for 60 minutes and you catch up with plasma. That is not the DCR concept. It's really not. So if you're going to do this in your center, you have to have it, and time is critical. How do we resuscitate? This is kind of philosophy of resuscitation. As a resident, I was, raised, I was trained to give a bunch of crystalloid and red cells, raise the blood pressure back to normal, and that was resuscitation. Check. And I, got a, I, mean, I didn't get in trouble in the morning report the next morning. It's clearly much more than that. You know, we need to resuscitate the endothelium, understand how to resuscitate that patient at the endothelial level to mitigate, not propagate, the iatrogenic or systemic injury to the endothelium, and that's really where I think almost all of this resuscitation is, stuff is going. So we uh, wrote a paper a number of years ago now called Damage Control Resuscitation, and we did what a lot of people do when you don't have data, is we put a bunch of authors on there, <laughs> gave lots of opinions, uh, named a thing called Damage Control Resuscitation, and really said, let's look at the diagnosis and treat the entire lethal triad equally, uh, equally, looking at the coagulopathy of trauma. The DCR components, number one, stop bleeding. Doesn't matter how you do it, clamps, fingers, tourniquets, whatever, balloons, stop bleeding, go to the operating room. Hypotensive resuscitation, don't pop the clot. Don't resuscitate back up to normal if you don't already have definitive hemorrhage control. Minimize crystalloid, minimize the crystalloid. Use thawed plasma to resuscitate with. If the patient needs resuscitate, if the words come out of your mouth, I need to resuscitate this patient, give them plasma, right? If they are dehydrated, you can give them all the crystalloid you want. Increased use of platelets. This is where I kind of go, who all thinks platelets are important to stopping bleeding? Raise your hands. I don't have the little clicker thing set up. You think platelets are important to stopping bleeding? Do you order platelets first? You don't have to answer that question. When do you order platelets? We were trained to order platelets late by the blood bankers after blood loss has stopped. Then they said, then give platelets so you don't waste them. But that doesn't make any sense, right? You don't need to give platelets if you stop the bleeding. You give platelets to help stop bleeding. Reverse the hypothermia, acidosis, the things we've talked about for decades. And of course, there's lots of adjuncts coming down the pike. There's a couple papers through here. Crystalloid to red cells. I'm just getting at the crystalloid amount. This is from the GLUE grant, showing that decreased crystalloid, decreasing crystalloid was associated with improved survival and uh, lowering the ARDS rate. Typical resuscitations. Think about the resuscitations just five, six, seven years ago with 20 and 30 liters of crystalloid and swollen up people in the ICU. We really don't see that anymore. Edema is really unusual, really unusual. Our ARDS rate in our ICU is 2%. It's gone from 7% to 2% in the last five years. We just looked at this before and after. 2% ARDS rate in the last 240 ICU admissions, trauma admissions to the ICU. And uh, by doing this changing resuscitation, we've decreased edema, MOF, ARDS, and improved survival. Don't see this much anymore. You know, this big bow wall edema, you just don't see it too much. What do we resuscitate with? This is our thawed plasma and red cells in the ED. You come into Houston, 
and, and get on a helicopter or come in our emergency department, you're not getting hardly any clear stuff. We almost get no clear stuff. We have all that clear stuff, crystalloids and colloids, but you just don't get it. You get red cells and plasma if you're in shock and if you're bleeding. If you're not, it doesn't, we can give you CT contrast agent, right, to resuscitate you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because you don't need it. This is the paper that got the ball rolling, published in 2007 from data collected in 2003 and 2004, 252 massive transfusion patients, a large number that suggested that increasing the plasma to red cell ratio, making it closer to one to one, was associated with improved survival. I, I, I didn't believe these data. They were too good to be true. We tried to make them fail. And even given the problems of collecting data in Iraq on civilians there who you had lost to follow up and military folks who traverse uh, three continents in 24 to 72 hours, we were still able to collect enough data to suggest that there was improved survival. We then came home and did the same study in, in 16 centers in the United States and published that in Annals of Surgery, 30,000 missions, 11,000 transfused, and 466 MT patients, a large, fairly large retrospective study and showed uh, improved survival in the patients who got earlier uh, and larger uh, and higher ratios, excuse me, higher ratios of plasma and platelets to red cells. The group that got the lower amounts or that lower curves didn't do as well. Kenji and Abba's group uh, also showed this with just platelets, looking at the delivery of platelets to patients. Now, platelets are interesting. You don't have to type in cross platelets, and there's no thawing of platelets. They, and so they are the most available blood product. We've all been conditioned by our blood bank colleagues not to order them, but in fact, they are the ones that are most available. Centers are starting to put platelets in their emergency department. There's a center uh, starting to put platelets on helicopters. So platelets are pretty interesting. And oh, by the way, that 300 cc bag of platelets, 10 cc's are platelets, 290 cc's, plasma. So in one bag of, quote, platelets, you get plasma and platelets. Pretty interesting concept from a bleeding point of view. Brian Cotton put together this before and after study, 04 and 08, to the last two years, 2008 to 10, looking at damage control resuscitation in the damage control surgery patients, the sickest of the sick, laparotomy patients, and what, what Brian showed in a single center study before and after is by decreasing crystalloid by over 50%, plasma uh, as well, red cells decreased and platelets were decreased. We were, by giving a balanced transfusion early, it was very clear that we gave less blood products and lowered all the inflammatory consequences of resuscitation. ALI, AKI, MOF were all lower in the balanced transfusion patients, and it wasn't because they were dying sooner. So in this large group of patients, they lived longer, survival was higher, inflammatory consequences lower. And, uh, and then the number of massive transfusions defined as 10 units in red cell, of red cells in 24 hours was also lower. We think this is because we were getting better control of bleeding, not having that coagulopathic bleeding. I've said this before, who remembers crystalloid coming out of arteries and veins? You guys remember the crystalloid coming out? When you gave a lot of crystalloid, or a, a Kool-Aid coming out when you gave a lot of crystalloid? That's a really bad sign really bad, all those patients died. We don't really see that much anymore. Now, Chris Snyder from the Alabama group published an extraordinarily important paper, and there's been several come out after that, uh, looking at survival bias. And the question here from a statistics epidemiology point of view is, are the patients living because they got plasma and platelets early, or are they living long enough to get plasma and platelets? Now, in Alabama, it takes 60 to 90 minutes, 93 minutes to get plasma into the patient. So it's hard for them to do a one-to-one -one study in Alabama because they don't have plasma in the ED, right? The mean time to hemorrhagic death is two and a half hours. And if you spend the majority of that time not giving any plasma to bleeding to death trauma patients, it's hard to say much about the plasma red cell ratio. Key point as you go through all the retrospective and even the prospective studies. How do you make blood products happen early? This is one of the questions that came off of the last session. <clears throat> you work with your blood bank and donor center. O red cells in the ED, AB or A plasma. AB is four to five percent of all uh, the population. By the way, massive transfusions, really sick trauma patients are four to five percent of all admissions. So it actually matches up pretty nicely, right? The, uh, and then A plasma is 30, 40, 50 percent of all the donors. And so there's lots of A plasma around. And people are now publishing uh, low titer A is <clears throat> equally as safe as AB plasma. Thawed or liquid plasma is what makes this available. The blood bankers themselves have published that a thawed plasma program decreases wastage of plasma. Uh, 
and put that in the journal transfusion. Platelets in the ED, what about platelets uh, pre-hospital? Kind of interesting concept. And then if it works in the ED, if these concepts work by mo moving the products out of the blood bank into the emergency department and we showed improved survival at every step of the way, why not put them pre-hospital? It's really the concept of pre-hospital trauma care. It's things that work in the hospital should work pre-hospital as long as it doesn't slow down arrival. Um, and people are starting to think about that as well. We've covered that. The prompt study uh, has been mentioned already. This was hiring people to stand in the corner, record what was going on. You can't design a prospective randomized trial with the data that's available in the, in the records, the charts in these patients, because they don't have the element of time recorded correctly. And if you looked at this, uh, by giving a, a, a more balanced approach, it may, people were trying to give one-to-one, one-to-two, were the two groups that, that uh, folks around at 10 trauma centers in the United States were giving. This is the platelet data. It's fascinating. I think it's one of the more important tables in this whole uh, paper. If you look at this hemorrhagic death at two and a half hours, at, at 50 percent of the trauma centers in the United States had not given platelets to patients who were bleeding to death. So we've been well instructed by our colleagues not to give platelets, and we're not doing it. And so I would really encourage you to order platelets sooner. You don't need to type and cross. You don't need to be thawed. And platelets are extreme, probably extremely important to helping stopping bleeding. The data suggests that earlier and higher ratios are important. You end up giving less blood products if you give a balanced ratio earlier. You end up giving less blood products in total. Lots of retrospective studies. We participated in a lot of them, published them. They were probably all almost inherently fatally flawed with survival bias. In fact, all trauma studies that have the element of time are inherently flawed with survival bias. Prompt was the prospective observational study we've mentioned. Dr. Cotton uh, published a whole blood versus component study. Marty Schreiber is, uh, has an ongoing frozen blood versus stored blood. Lots of blood studies are starting to happen in the trauma space, which is really good. We're trying, finally figuring out products that have been around for 30, 40, 50 years, finally doing level one high quality studies. And PROPER has been mentioned. It's a prospective randomized study uh, that at 12 centers in North America, 680 patients. We're down to the last uh, 30 or so patients should be done in the next two weeks. Hopefully have some nice results with level one, large, large uh, numbers of patients looking at 24 hour and 30 day mortality. Starting to wrap up here very quickly, how does plasma work? If it works, if it helps, how does it work? I, I actually don't think it's much about replacing the coagulation proteins that people talk about. I think it's about stabilizing endothelium. And uh, our thought process, if you look in that top, uh, top left-hand graph, that's a normal uh, red blood cell or going through a capillary, you go into shock, endothelium opens up with shock, that's what happens. If you walk up and pump a lot of crystalloid in there, you make the, you keep those, uh, uh, that parasite permeability open, drive fluid into the interstitium. But if you resuscitate with plasma or platelets and or platelets, what we think is happening is it tightens up those endothelial cells and you have less edema, you end up using less blood products and less fluid. One slide from Hassan Alam's group now in Michigan, this was done when he was in Harvard, these are pig brains with contusions resuscitated in shock and resuscitated with normal saline, hexten, or FFP. And the FFP group clearly has a smaller contusion volume. Uh, and then this, the, uh, the objective values are listed down below. So FFP, aftershock and after TBI, probably stabilizes the blood brain barrier, probably decreases the secondary brain insult. Uh, and, and so it has nothing to do with the coagulation proteins, but more about stabilization. No distinction between pre and, po and the hospital. It should be a seamless continuum of care. What works in the hospital should be used pre-hospital. As I mentioned this morning, we have four helicopters, 19 months, over 100, actually it's up to 200 patients now. And what we've seen is that, that giving pre-hospital red cells and plasma is associated with improved early survival and with very low wastage. <clears throat> These are uh, medics in World War II giving dried plasma on the beaches of Anzio. This is not from uh, you know, a, a Tom Hanks movie. So they're holding up real dried plasma, giving to real combat casualties pre-hospital. These are Israeli medics up on the Golan Heights a couple months ago. They're holding that AB plasma, dried AB plasma. In the IDF, in the whole country of Israel, this is their standard pre-hospital resuscitative fluid. That's their paper that's uh, published in Shock last month talking about this. From the whole country has switched over. U.S. medics in Afghanistan are carrying French dried plasma in their rucks, so there's glass bottles in their rucksack as they hike around the, uh, 
mountains of Afghanistan. It's in the Special Operations Forces. It's their primary resuscitative fluid for hemorrhagic shock. So what do we do today in Houston? We identify the patients who need resuscitation, pre-hospital and hospital. If they need resuscitation, they get plasma and red cells, not crystalloid. We transfuse in a balanced fashion and a ratio driven, starting with the first units. Platelets are given early. When, when bleeding slows down, where lab values come back in a relevant time period, we switch over to lab-based or tag-driven resuscitation. So we actually merge this ratio and uh, laboratory-driven uh, resuscitation pattern. It's not r rigidly one way or the other, and plasma is our primary resuscitation fluid. I think I've covered all of that already, and I'm probably over time. Thank you very much.